In an effort to keep this video as concise and as punchy as I can, I've had to rethink how I'm going to approach it, because there are so many things that I could talk about when it comes to the Quattroporte that this could easily turn into like a two-hour podcast just about my time with these cars. And even though some people might want to hear that, if you do let me know and I could always do that, for now I think people kind of want to know the, the Cliffs Notes, really. The things that you should know, the things that you should be worried about, maybe the things that should make you reconsider buying one or consider buying one. So let's just cut to the chase and get into the basics, the overarching things that you need to know from someone who has owned Quattroportes long term. For full exposure, the Quattroporte is the only car I have ever bought more than once. Every other vehicle that I've owned, I've had it, I've enjoyed it, and I've moved on. The Quattroporte, I've come back three times. A 2005, a 2009, and a 2008. That alone speaks volumes to how much I love them, but also it begs the question of why did I get rid of them, and then why did I keep coming back? Well, that one's fairly easy to answer. I get rid of cars no matter whether I like them or not generally, because I just like trying new things. So it's not uncommon at all for me to move on to a new car after like five months, even if it's a really good one. For me to keep a car for around a year or more is a big deal, and it doesn't happen that often, so that's not really a cause for concern. In fact, the only time that I've got rid of a Quattroporte out of those three occasions because of problems was the first one, which was a 2005 Duo Select, and many of the reasons, if not all of the reasons really, why I recommend not purchasing a Duo Select Quattroporte at all, so there's my first piece of advice, a very controversial one, is because of my time with that car. But not even just because of my time, it's because of the way the car is engineered. See, even Maserati themselves decided to drop that gearbox in around 2007 and move on to a much more conventional ZF. They still use ZFs to this day in their newer Quattroportes with diesel engines, etc., so clearly it wasn't a choice that they regretted. Some people dislike it because it doesn't feel maybe quite as special, they're not quite as sharp, not quite as quick, the weight distribution is a little bit different, etc, etc. You're never going to win over someone like that because it's all down to personal preference. There's nothing wrong with that. All I can tell you though is that in the time that I had mine, I found it to be a fundamentally flawed car. And because I've gone super in-depth into my thoughts in other reviews here in Beards and Cars for each of these cars individually, be it the Duo Select, be it the ZF, I don't want to retread that too much, so I definitely recommend checking those videos out as well. But for now, I'll say it's a supercar gearbox in a two-ton limo. And as cool as that sounds, it's just fundamentally flawed. The gearbox is not an automatic for a start, it's an automated manual. So it has a clutch, but the computer operates it for you. Which means that if you use it in drive mode, like an actual automatic, it will eat its own clutch, amongst other things. F1 pump failure, for example, is a very common thing on Quattroportes. Secondly, though, it means that if you do decide to use it with the paddles all the time, well then now what's the point of having a big two-ton four-door limo that's like 17 feet long? At that point, literally, why not just buy a Grand Sport or a 4200? or a 3200. If you really must have a Maserati, and don't really care apparently about the luxury part, just buy a sports car. Because they, after all, still have four seats, technically. So to me, that one's fairly cut and dried. Even in best case scenarios, it's a fundamentally flawed concept. So for me, that's my concise thoughts on the Duo Select. Like the 2005 car that I had, that's the lighter blue one here in the video, where I'm wearing the check shirt. It's just not a car that I can recommend. It's as simple as that. It's fundamentally flawed, even at the best of times, and for every bit of fun that it gives you, it's not really worth the level of risk. Moving on, though, to the other two which I had, the darker blue 2009 and the dark green 2008, both, of course, facelift models with ZF boxes, these are, without question, as far as I'm concerned, the best Quattroportes ever. And I will take it even further than that and be super controversial by saying that I believe 2008 to 2012 is actually Maserati's best years period. Not just for the Quattroporte, but the Gran Turismo as well was in that time and is also fantastic. This is not to say that they are perfect cars. They are not unbreakable. They are not the kind of machines that you can just do the oil once a year and forget about everything else. They absolutely can and will have their problems. The way that I describe Maserati ownership to people is really two things. 
One, you will never have a Maserati that everything works perfectly on. And if you do, it will be for about five minutes. And B, I prefer to take the approach that the less things I use on it, the less things will probably break. So if you have stuff like the rear sun visor, which is a common thing to break, sunroofs, which are always a risk on any car, I've only had that on one of my three, various other generally electrical gremlins that these vehicles can have will be the bane of your ownership time. Now, I'm not going to say that it will ruin the experience. Again, I own three of them, so clearly not but in a very similar way to something like a Jag XKR, in which most of my problems were these smaller electrical gremlins and issues, it's not that any of them are even that expensive generally to fix, it's more of just an annoyance. On the other end of the spectrum though, I've also owned a car which you would think would be much more bulletproof. A Bentley. I had a W12 Flying Spur. Very similar kind of price bracket to a Quattroporte, and even faster, even more luxurious, even more exotic, you could say. And you would hope, for that kind of used price and even new price, a better built machine, certainly with Volkswagen backing, and it just isn't. It did not work out that way at all, and they are known for having a lot of risks. So to me, I would actually not say that Maseratis are any less reliable than many other luxury cars or performance cars in their segment. From my real-world experience, they're about the same. <laughs> the only real difference that I found with owning a Maserati was not even the price of the parts, and certainly not the price of the labour, because a lot of the stuff that I had done on mine was actually just done by a competent mechanic. Maseratis are not as specialised as you might think. It's not like an Aston Martin where you kind of should take it to a specialist, if nothing else but for provenance. With a Maserati, you can, but you really don't have to. They're not overly complex cars, mechanically speaking, and generally the engines don't tend to be the issue. You know, say what you will about Ferrari, but they do seem to know what they're doing when it comes to building a good engine. With Quattroportes, it's always the electrical stuff. And occasionally you'll have a gearbox issue or a suspension component that needs changing, but again, a lot of that can happen to literally any car. The only real problem with Quattroportes is those electrical gremlins. Those are the things that you'll notice first. And I would even go so far as to say you shouldn't necessarily even expect everything to work. And that sounds like a cop-out, but... Imagine that you're going to buy something like a TVR. You know, you don't expect it to be a perfect experience because you know that's part of the deal. With a Maserati, you just have to be prepared for that. And if it's not worth it to you, maybe avoid it. I will go ahead and say, though, don't get your hopes up if you buy something like a Mercedes or a Beamer or a Jag. They can have plenty of problems of their own and sometimes cost a lot more to fix. To return to my point, though, of what the actual issue is when it comes to fixing or repairing a Maserati... From my experience, it's not fitting the parts, it's not disassembling the car, and it's actually not even the price of the stuff itself. And of course that will depend on the model that you buy, because GTS stuff costs a lot more. It's actually just the waiting time. Because a lot of these things, even if you buy it from Scuderia Car Parts, for example, who I've used in the past, many of them have to come from Italy. So they take a long time, or at least long times in comparison to normal parts here in the UK. So it's these things where I would describe it as more of an annoyance rather than a massive financial burden. Now, speaking of the ongoing financial burden or lack thereof, what other expenses are there? What are they like to live with in terms of fuel, in terms of taxes? Well, if you're going to buy a Maserati, you probably don't care too much about tax. But just to touch on it for a second, if you buy a 2005 or earlier car, you're technically going to get it cheaper. But I already said I wouldn't recommend doing that. So tax-wise, unfortunately, you should be expecting to pay the highest band there is. So in other words, the same as a Jag or an AMG or whatever else. In terms of fuel, I actually don't find them to be that bad. And this really does depend on how you drive it. If you put it in sport mode or drive it in paddles all the time and use it like it's a Ferrari, it's going to drop like a stone. It is, after all, still a two-ton car. If you leave it in drive, let the gearbox do its thing, and drive it like you would an Audi or a Beamer, just wafting down the road in this piece of art with the steering wheel, which was my approach, I used to average about 22, 23 to the gallon out of it. So, actually, not bad at all. And coupled with a decent-sized fuel tank, it's a pretty damn good long-distance car. Now, speaking of long distances and practicality, one of the key advantages of a Quattroporte over buying something like a traditional two-door GT car is the extra space. The boot space, although a notch back, which completely differentiates it from the Aston Martin Rapide and the Porsche Panamera, which are both hatchbacks, the boot is good. 
it's about the same as a Gran Turismo or so, so it's not, you know, the best boot ever, but it's more than big enough for any needs I ever had. The real kicker is, though, the rear seat space. And when I'm referring to space, there are certain things that I'm not going to say on YouTube, but suffice it to say that the Maserati is definitely a lot more Italian in the kind of spatial requirements of the rear seat than a Porsche Panamera or an Aston Martin Rapide. It's a proper full-size bench with five actual seats rather than the more cockpit or fighter jet style four-seat layout with a very large center console that the Panamera and the Aston Martin both have. They're lovely cars, but it is one of the key advantages of the Maserati, and again, I've talked about that in a showdown that I did between the three. I would say that these cars are not something you should ever buy as an investment. You should definitely bear in mind that if you ever do want to get rid of it, it will potentially be difficult to sell, because a lot of people are misinformed, or just even worse, uninformed, and have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to Maseratis. People who are just terrified of the badge, just know that if you ever do want to sell it, it could take a while. <laughs> in my experience, sometimes you'll get lucky. Uh, in the case of my blue one, for example, I ended up losing a lot of money on the first one. The second one, was good. I shouldn't have really gotten rid of it. That was the whole reason why I got the third one, because I regretted getting rid of the second. The second I actually traded against the Bentley, funnily enough, what turned out to be a poor decision. But still, I've owned a Bentley, so I guess there's that life experience. And the third one, I ultimately bought as the green one, my favourite of the three, finally had my favourite wheels, had the lovely wood steering wheel, even had the sunroof, and it was a gorgeous car. Funnily enough, exactly the same mileage as the dark blue one, but even then I decided ultimately to get rid of my third one much more recently because I just kind of realised after a few months of owning it, I've got what I wanted from these now. I've had three of them, I know what to expect, and I've reached that phase where I want to move on and try something new. And try something new I certainly did, because now I'm driving a mid-60s Ford station wagon <laughs> with a Mustang engine, so clearly it's a very different thing to a Maserati, but that's the story of my life when it comes to cars. I like trying new things, and I don't like to stagnate. So in terms of my overall thoughts on living with a Quattroporte, I think those are the main things that you need to know. In summary, Buy yourself a 2008 to 2012 facelift. In my opinion, those are the best. Make sure it has the ZF box. And above all else, make sure that the mileage is as low as you can afford. It has the least owners you can find and the most service history. Because with a Maserati, it really is a case of prevention rather than cure. These are not Jaguars. Jaguars are far easier to live with. I will absolutely say that. And part of the reason why something like an XFR, XKR, S-Type R, whatever, is so much easier to live with is because they're simpler cars. Jags are basically muscle cars in tuxedos, and that works to their merit. Maseratis are not. This is not an Italian Jaguar. It's not an Italian Beamer. It's not an Italian Mercedes. It's a four-door Ferrari, and it should be treated as such. It needs to be doted on. It needs to be serviced. It needs to be treated like a delicate piece of handcrafted Italian art. Because that's what it is. It's not a tank to be thrown around, mismanaged, poorly serviced or not serviced. You have to treat it with respect and love. And if you do, it will make a difference. It still won't be perfect. It will still have its issues, mostly electrical but it will give you a much better chance of having a good long time of enjoyment with it and enjoying it so much that for me, for example, you come back for more if you ever do sell one. That's it for my thoughts and experiences on owning a Quattroporte. In terms of really the main things I think you need to know, both good and bad, and like I said, if you are doing a deep dive on owning one of these cars, absolutely check out the other videos that I've done. I've done individual reviews for the Joy Select, for the ZF. Of course, I did my announcement videos for when I first bought the cars. And I did a best and worst things about owning a Maserati Quattroporte as more of an overview video as well. So check out all of those. There's plenty of additional information or information that I've touched on here that I elaborate more on in those videos as well. But if you do decide to get one of these Italian beauties, I hope you enjoy it, of course. And until next time, I'll see you then. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.